I'm going to say good morning to you and tell you how great it is to be here, how great it is to be in uh, your presence, to know that we are collectively uh, gathered here together to worship our Heavenly Father, the one uh, true God in spirit and in truth, uh, to be with in this place with people of like mind and of like faith is truly a blessing. And we are indeed blessed to today to be uh, called and to be considered God's uh, children. Uh, it is so uh, wonderful uh, just to come out on the first day of the week and um, to give honor and praise to our God. Uh, to have the knowledge uh, of the importance of worship is a tremendous blessing. And so we are, again, as Christians, um, truly, uh, truly um, blessed people. I want to ask you before we go uh, to God in prayer to turn back to Genesis chapter 3. This morning we want to give the concluding part to last week's sermon uh, on uh, the home and godliness. This morning we want to talk to you on the subject of the ways that godliness benefit the home. We made the point uh, that godliness uh, blesses the home and profits the home and and this week we want to talk about some of the ways that godliness um, is advantageous and tremendously beneficial to the home but before we go to God in prayer again let's read Genesis chapter 3 verses 8 through 13 the Bible says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Father, again, we thank you and we praise you for all that you've given and all that you've done above all for your Son, our Savior, that has made not only this gathering possible, Lord, but this covenant uh, and this relationship that we are experienced and that we are a part of. His blood has made it possible. Thank you so much for your Son, his blood. We pray now that as your covenant people, as we study your word, Lord, that this agreement that we have entered into through our obedience to the gospel, Lord, that we have not entered it too lightly, Lord. We know that our responsibility as your children is to hear your word and to grow from it. We know, Lord, that our intention ought to be to be obedient from the heart to it. And so we pray, Lord, that by faith we're learning the value of looking past the speaker with his weaknesses and shortcomings. And that we are by faith looking to you, knowing that everything that is good and right and true and eternal belong to you. And all the mistakes, Lord are those of the speaker. These things we pray and ask in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. The fear that led Adam and Eve to hide themselves from God was not the kind of reverence that we talked about last week, this godliness. Godliness denotes uh, a godly uh, reverence, a reverence for God. That's not what they were experiencing. That's not uh, what their actions displayed. It was not when we look at Genesis 3, it was not a pure awe and a pious attitude towards God. That was what it was like in the very beginning before they ate of the fruit. But now that they have eaten and disobeyed God, they have lost that childlike reverence that God wants all of us really to have. This fear that is described by Adam. And see that he admits to it. This fear that he talks about was the result of his sin and from a worldly shame. So 
he, he hid, he hides himself from God. Again, in the beginning, up until now, their home, the home of Adam and Eve, could be and should be categorized as godly and reverent in behavior. Up until now, they obeyed all of the commands of God. They obeyed God because when they saw God, they saw him as an almighty being, a loving God, but a God to have reverence and awe for. That's what categorized uh, their home up until this point. And as a result, their home enjoyed the blessings of being in God's fellowship up until now. Not only has the result of this eating of this forbidden tree impacted the relationship with God, if you notice it impacts now how they see God, it impacts how they relate to God, now they're hiding where once, like in a pure reverence, they walked freely. Now they see themselves as naked and they feel ashamed, and so it's changed what? Not only their relationship with God from eating, but now if you look at the words, it has even changed their relationship between what? One another. He says, that woman that you, that you gave me. So it even affected this relationship between them. And I want us to understand that, it, that impact as we consider uh, godliness in the home and the necessity for it. And the lack of godliness in the home and the result of it. I want us to understand that the trouble and the difficulty is recorded for our learning and should remind us why it is important that our homes are established by godliness. It's not just enough for us to look at the book of Genesis, look at the fall of man and say, okay, this is how we can track down the first sin of man. That is important, but we also ought to see certain things that are indicative of the home, indicative of a godly home, because we do in the beginning see that picture, but we also need to learn what's indicative of a home that lacks godliness because that is also shown to us as well. We ought to look at these as reminders to us and we ought to be cognizant of the fact that it's important that our homes are established by godliness, that our homes have as its foundation a godliness and that, that godliness does what grows in the heart of every member that is in that home. That's when we talked about generational godliness being passed from generation to generation. Well, it starts today for us. It really ought to. We ought to consider these things from a powerful standpoint of, of, of these things being foundational for us. In other words, what I'm saying to you, and please hear me, the home that honors God in everything and reveres and fears him piously and respectfully can expect abundant blessings from God. The godly home, in other words, and I'll say it again, the godly home, the individuals in that home that dedicate themselves to revering the one true God and respecting him and reverently obeying him from the heart can expect the promises of blessings from God. And we ought to want that in our homes, whether we are husbands and, 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 or mothers and, uh, or children, whatever it is, we ought to want the blessings of God. Nobody can bless us. Nobody can give us advantages like God can give us. And so I want us to understand this, and, and please hear this as well. Please hear this. This is not the preacher standing behind this wooden uh, pulpit to indict anybody's home. I have a home myself, and as I've told you from the scriptures, the Bible teaches us that there is dysfunction in every home. No home is perfect. So it's not for, for you to take this attitude that I'm trying to indict anyone's home. All of our homes are impacted and have been impacted by sin, and they will be again. They will be impacted by bad decisions. My Heart's desire is that we will listen to God's word, see the tremendous value of godliness, and strive to do his will. That's, that's all my purpose today. Is that whatever we have done in the past, that we will leave that in the past and that we will take today for what it is today, a new start, and live in a godly manner today if we can. See, these blessings that we talk about today should encourage us all to strive for more godly homes. Even if you can say presently today that my home is a godly home, that we ought to strive more and more for godliness. That's what my desire is. And so what I'm saying to you today that is if your home 
is not presently walking in godliness. Maybe that is you. Whether you're in this audience or whether you're listening virtually, then today ought to be the day of salvation for your family. If, you're, if you are an individual that is a member of a home and a member of a family, and we all are, and you are the one that's keeping that home from being unified in godliness, today ought to be the day of salvation for you, and you ought to have a change of mind. If you're not striving or cooperating with folk in the home who want to live a godly life and want to have the blessings of a godly home, then if you're the one that needs to change, whether you are a wife or a husband or a child, today ought to be the day that you change. And if you are a member outside of a godly home, we have children that have left home and left the word of God. We have husbands or wives that have done that. And if you are a member outside of a godly home, while those members are still striving for godliness, then this is the purpose of this lesson. It is to encourage you, not to indict. It is to exhort and to encourage, and for us to see how it blessed it is to have a home that is blessed by God. And so I want to give you several uh, of these blessings. I want to remind you of the benefits of godliness in the godly home. Number one. The first benefit of a godly home is a reasonable measure of satisfaction and fulfillment of the members of that home. The first thing that I want you to consider about a godly home and the blessings of a godly home is that in a godly home there is a reasonable measure of satisfaction and fulfillment of the members in that family and in that home. This means that the members of that home consistently experience a degree of contentment from the workings of that home, from the efficiency of that home. And that's what God wants the home to be like. God wants the home, he wants individuals to find a certain type of contentment in that home. That as that home is working properly, that all of those members are feeling satisfied and fulfilled. There are a lot of homes where everybody is scattered in thought and in heart and in mind, and folk are just dissatisfied with how the home is, work, is running and how things are going in the home. And there are several reasons for that. But God has given us through his word the ability through a godly home that all of the members in that home, from daddy to mama to husband to wife to children, for all of them to be what? Fulfilled and satisfied to experience a level of contentment based upon how that home works if we would trust in him. The home is designed to function in certain ways and meet to some extent certain needs of each member. That's how God has designed the home. And these needs are intended, now please hear me, these needs are intended to equip each member with the ability to serve, not to be served, but to serve. That's what the home is made for and designed for. It's not for the children to be put on the pedestal and for children to be made more important than the parents or daddy to be made more important or mama to be made. No, God is glorified in the home and everyone in that home ought to see that the design of the home, the way the home is created by God is for every member to serve so that everybody's needs, amen, can be met. That's the design of the home. It should be that in a home, the culture is, is that we are all servants of God and therefore servants of what? Of one another. And that's how you have everybody's needs met. That's how you find contentment and fulfillment and satisfaction. So these needs are not about any individual's self-gratification. That's not how and why the home is designed and built. Too many people today think that everything is about their happiness. And, and women shouldn't get married because they want some man to make them happy. And men should not get married because they want some woman to make them happy. They shouldn't have children because they believe that children are going to make them happy. That's not the way that the home is designed. The home is designed, in, order, in other words, to glorify God through serving one another. And then there's contentment found in that manner and in that way. It's not about self-gratification. It's not about me or individuals in a home trying to gain personal goals and set certain ambitions and then using everyone in the home to make and reach those goals. That's not the purpose of the home. 
above everything and everyone else. That's not why we should do, put ourselves above folk. But the home should function as productively and efficiently as possible. This means what? This means that in the home, that there ought to be folk, everyone in the home ought to be taught how to do what? Love one another. That's the purpose of a home, is that everybody, they're growing in their love for one another, and everyone is being held accountable and responsible to do what? To love everyone in the home. Everyone in the home should be taught. It is their responsibility to learn how to love every other member in that home so that all can give and experience love. That's how we all experience love. There should not be individuals who can say that I was never loved in my home. God has designed it in such a way that when everyone is taught how to love and we see ourselves as givers of love, then everybody in that home does what? They feel loved in that home. That's how the home is supposed to function. The home is designed not only that, but it's designed to help one another to know the role of each member and the role that the person plays in the home and then helping that person to fulfill that role. Everyone has a role in the home. Mama's not daddy. Daddy's not mama. The husband's not the wife, and the wife is not the husband. Children and sons in the home should not act as if they are equal to daddy and to mama. Everyone has a role, and that role ought to be taught. Those roles ought to be taught, and then those ought to be embraced within the home. That's why God has designed the, the home, to function in that manner. That's a functioning home, where everyone knows what their role is, and then they are taught what? The desire to fulfill it. That's what God teaches us in Scripture. Not only that, but the design of the home is to help one another develop social skills. So that folk can go out into the world and, and deal with people and, and to be able to talk in a way that is pleasing to God and the ability to get along with other people in society. Those things are primarily learned where? Not at school. It's not for the teacher. It's for parents to teach children how to, to adapt socially without, especially in a Christian home, without giving and succumbing to those things. But learning how to get along as best they can with individuals how to deal with folks socially, those things are learned in the home. And we have to understand that that's a functioning part of the home. Of course, in the Christian home, helping one another to serve in the church, that is a part of the responsibilities of the home and a functioning home is where folk learn how to serve in the church and they find their place among the brethren. The church, in other words, ought to be important to the folk in the home. It ought to be important to daddy and to mommy. It ought to be important to those children growing up. We ought to teach our children the importance of the church by our actions and by our words and our dedication to the church. We ought to understand that a functioning home is about providing for each other's needs in terms of physical growth in terms of mental and intellectual health and even spiritual growth. That all starts where? In the home. Again, being in a family is doing what God has given me to do to serve the folk that are in my family and in that home and help my family to reach those particular goals that God has. See, receiving much of my growth and ability starts where? Not, I don't want schools to teach, and I never did. Me and Robin never wanted the schools to be the primary teacher of social skills and of morality. We didn't want our children's teachers teaching that. So we did our best to teach that in the home. That's what God has designed the home for. And so that growth and the ability comes from the home. This is what truly brings satisfaction and fulfillment and contentment. In other words, what I'm saying to you about this whole concept of serving teaching all of the members in that home about the value of serving and helping one another to grow in every way comes straight from the principles of the Lord Jesus who said that it's more blessed to do what? To give than it is to receive. A home should not be seen as a, a place where I get all of my needs met. It ought to be something that we look at where we are givers because that's how the family will be blessed. That's when all of the folk in the home receive fulfillment and satisfaction when everyone has that mindset of serving and helping one another to grow in every way. Jesus said it, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And when everyone in the home has come to believe this, 
when everyone in the home is devoted and pursues this, God will bring joy and goodness to that home. God will bless that home. He's promised that when our reverence for him and our godly attitude and pious attitude towards him causes us to serve, then God will give us the blessings of contentment and fulfillment within that home. There are a lot of folk in a lot of homes where, where there's so much selfishness that, that, that there's a lack of fulfillment. Fathers have learned to live with certain things and so they, they don't say anything and, and mothers have learned to deal with this because he's so selfish and children see their parents as truly being selfish and so there's not a fulfillment. That is not how God wants the home to be. He designed it even from the very beginning for it to bring a certain fulfillment and a certain level of satisfaction and a, a powerful uh, expression of contentment there, an attitude of contentment. And that contentment coming through service and being contented from what? From godly things. In Psalm 133, I want to read this. And we don't have a lot of time. It's a very powerful psalm. But it, it denotes similarly what we're talking about. About Now, the immediate context was about Zion or Israel. Uh, and so today the application would be in the immediate context how the church can receive the blessings of God, but it so most certainly has an application to the home as well. God will bless the family and the home that remembers this powerful psalm and, and the words to this psalm. He says, the psalmist does in Psalm 133, how very good and pleasant it is, not just minimally good, but how very good it is and how pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Think about the family where every member is unified and pursuing godliness, he's saying. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down over the collar of his robes. He's talking about refreshment. So he gives two examples. He gives Aaron as high priest and this oil of anointment being poured on him and it's over, running over his head all the way onto his beard, onto his collar where a, a, a certain type of necklace was uh, around the collar of the high priest and all of the names of the tri 12 tribes of Israel was around his neck. And so the idea is that the whole house of God is what? Dwelling in pleasantness and in goodness, in refreshment when there is this unity of pursuing God. He says, verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon. Hermon was a mountain that was uh, near Jerusalem that, was, that had ice caps. And much of this, 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 these ice caps would just would produce what? Dew and would produce just overflowing waters that brought refreshment uh, to the people of, of Jerusalem. So this is what he's describing, the pleasantness and the goodness when brethren dwell together in unity. He says, which falls on the mountains of Zion. He, he gives this idea of the, the, the dew of Hermon, which it did not do, falling on uh, the mountains of Zion. He says, oh, if it were like that, if these, these saturated, uh, dewy, uh, and just watery mountains of Hermon just fell on, on, on Mount Zion. How wonderful that would be. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Satisfaction and contentment found in a godly home. But number two, in a godly home, wisdom and understanding light the path. Wisdom and understanding light the path of a godly home. In other words, a godly home is a home that seeks to honor God in everything that the individuals do. That's what the desire is. And that reverence becomes the very light that leads them. Turn to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Proverbs 9, verse 10. Because the wise man puts it this way. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. He says, when an individual or when a home it, it is godly, when that is their aim, when the fear of the Lord is their aim and their pursuit, 
It is the beginning of what? Of wisdom. That's where wisdom starts. Piousness and all for God lead to the abundance of wisdom. And there needs to be wisdom in a home. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Look at verses 13 through 18. Now I could look at the whole chapter. We don't have time to look at the whole chapter. But the whole chapter talks about the benefits of wisdom. But look at verses 13 through 18 in Proverbs chapter 3. Because the wise man wants us to understand the value of wisdom. He says, happy are those who find wisdom and those who get understanding for her income. The income of wisdom is better than silver and her revenue better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called happy. A home needs to dwell in the wisdom of God because that wisdom will do what? Light the path for that home and for the people in that home. When a home is led and guided by God's word, and when the objective of the people in that home is to honor God, they have nothing to fear. Let me say that again. When you have a home that honors God and seeks to honor him in every decision, in every thought, to ask God before every step is taken, there is nothing to fear in a home that's a godly home. Nothing to fear. Every direction that that home goes in, every decision that is made in that home will be blessed and will be a blessing. That, that family and that home will be a blessing to others as well. Too many men lean on their worldly experience to lead them and to guide them, to lead their family. Too many men use their instinct to raise their children. Too many men and women use their earthly perspective to guide the family morally. And too many men and women use their academic learning to train their children concerning that child's path. And in the reality, we ought to lean on the wisdom of God that is found in his word. That earthly wisdom cannot benefit us like the word of God can benefit us. It always leads to destruction. It always leads to peril. But wisdom acquired from fearing God, where every decision wants to please him and honor him, that type of wisdom produces a harvest of righteousness. The godly home is blessed because wisdom is found in the godly home. But not only that, number three, a godly home it's a home that grows, and when a home grows in godliness, it becomes stronger, and the individuals in that home draw closer together during difficult times. When you, when you look at a godly home, when folk are dedicated to godliness, and their attitude is a pious reverence for God, and difficult times come, those folk don't scatter. They do what? They bind together even closer to one another. They are even closer. They become stronger. And they become closer to each other. Heavenly wisdom brings protection to the home, as we talked about. But there are some things that the home will inevitably experience. In other words, that wisdom that we just talked about will protect us and will keep us from experiencing certain things. But then there are other things that no matter how godly your home is, that home will still experience certain inevitable difficulties, things like loss and death. A godly home is not protected from these things. Sickness. Godly homes experience certain circumstances that God allows to test the individuals in that home and to test that home. You will go through these things. God allows those. The home that relies on God during difficult times, please listen to me. The home that relies on him, the home that trusts in him and does not waver during difficult and hard times, that home that responds to tragedy and difficulty in a godly and a biblical manner, that home that when they experience these hardships, they look to heaven, that type of home experiences growth and becomes stronger as a unit. And that's what God would have us to be. Have you ever seen individuals in a home or a family go through certain turmoil? 
even Christian homes. And when they do, it's the breakup of the family. Parents get divorced and they split up. Kids don't talk to each other anymore. That's not God's design. A godly home that is secure in the word of God, when tragedy comes and when difficulty comes, they not only become stronger as individuals, but they are bound together even closer than they once were. That's the benefit of godliness. They are comforted by God's word. They look at passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 1 where the Bible talks about God is the God of all comfort. And they don't look to other sources of comfort. They don't look to other means of satisfaction or other means of consolation. They look to God and they utilize God's word through the family. And then they bind and they are bound together through God's word. And they are strengthened together and they get through that particular tragedy, that particular loss together, loving one another all the more. That's the godly home. That's the home that relies on God. In some homes, when things like death take place, or life-threatening illnesses take place, or issues beyond that home's control take place, the individuals either deal with those things alone, where everybody just, they lock themselves in their room and they just deal with it alone. They don't really talk about what's going on all that much. Either that's the issue, they may go out to friends and, and celebrate or do certain things with friends to get their minds off of certain things, or individuals in that home are so fearful that they argue and fight when there are difficulties. Mama's got this prognosis of, of, of cancer and so everybody begins to fight and to bicker. Everybody begins to, to out of fear, to argue with one another. Or they do what? They stop trusting in him and stay united. They stay united, but they say, listen, if God loved us, he wouldn't have brought us to this point. So we're going to handle this on our own. And so they do what? They get through it with worldly ways. And much of it is oftentimes by leaving the church instead of relying on God. But the godly home, the home that is determined to see God as greater than our circumstances. That home that seeks to honor him and to glorify him, that particular home becomes stronger. That particular home, they, they learn how to endure things through these testings, and they also grow closer. They, they cling to each other all the more. There's more affection between them. They began to, to recognize, really, the, the inevitable things of life. And so they don't take their relationship with each other for granted. And so they cling even closer to one another. Think about Paul's words in, the, in Romans chapter 5. And I know we're almost out of time, but Romans chapter 5, look at verses 1 through 5. Look at what Paul says. And so this application can go to the home as well. It's to the Christian and the individual Christian, but it also can apply to the home because God's word works for the home in this manner as well. Romans 5, look at verses 1 through 5. He says, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have or let us have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we, or let us boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. You see that? Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Think about the family in the home that by faith trusts in God during difficult times. What happens to that family? They develop a greater character and a, an abiding hope. They develop a tremendous hope. Families need to develop a godly character just like the individual. This comes from faith and comes from walking with God and trusting God through difficult times. And when you do that, God makes that family stronger as individuals. And he makes that Satan wants to do to every home. What he did to Adam and Eve's home, he has been trying to do to your home as well. Now let's think about that. He didn't stop. 
He didn't say, well, my job is done. Got the first home, and, and that should just trickle down to everybody else. No. Satan came by your house today. He'll be back. He's been by my house. Sometimes I've been the one that let him in and invited him to sit on the couch with me. That's Satan. He wants to do to every home, especially every godly home, what he did in the beginning is to diminish the reverence that that home and the members of that home have for the one true God, the almighty God. Understand that that is the enemy that we are dealing with. And because of this, that God is bigger than you and bigger than what you may want in your aim in life. Every individual in that home ought to cling closely to him because no conflict should be greater than God's purpose for the family. Amen. There is nothing that mommy and daddy can go through that you can imagine that they should not in the end resolve and be one again. Amen. There is nothing that can happen between parents and children, father and sons, that they say that that's the end of it. God can do what? He can bring resolve to conflicts. See, Satan wants individuals striving for their own desires, and that's where the conflicts come. We don't have time to look at it, but you do in your own studies. Go to James chapter 4 and look at James, because he tells you where conflicts and disputes come. They come from folk who are selfish and trying to fulfill their own lusts. Because they want certain things and don't get them. And then when they ask God for certain things, they ask them to, to get things for their own desires. You have that in the home. And so when folk don't get what they want, and this person stands against, in the home, stands against what I want, there's bitterness between husbands and wives. Right even in the church. Folk who will come to worship together, and sometimes it's gotten so bad that they come separate in cars and they don't care who knows. Amen. That's what the devil will do. Because we think that what has been done to me and she hurt me or he hurt me, and that's just too much. We have so much pride as human beings. So much pride. As soon as something is done to us, we think that it's unforgivable. And then we come and worship and we sing, oh, how I love Jesus. That's not the way that it's supposed to be. It's not. And sadly, there are some folk who get along with everybody in the Lord's church and don't even get along with their spouse. Treat everybody in the church with tremendous love except their spouse because of something that he did or something that she did or 10, 15 years ago that they've repented of 40 times. And in the godly home, there is conflict, and these conflicts are resolved. Satan wants us bitter against one another. Wives are bitter towards husbands in the church. Husbands against wives, children, uh, hate parents, and, and, and everything that's ever happened in their life is mom and daddy's fault. I don't even talk to my mom and daddy anymore because they destroyed my life. Even though you've had control of your life for the last 30 years, it's still mom and daddy's fault. <laughs> and there ought not be anything that keeps us from what? Coming together. In a godly home, a home that professes godliness. In a godly home, the word ought to compel us. And in a godly home, the word does compel every member to strive for unity. The father is not thinking that he's above everybody else. Daddy doesn't think that he's the center of everything. And sadly, sisters, we do it because of our time. And, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but we have a lot of dissension in a family because too many women believe that they're the center and the backbone of the home. So the home is destroyed. Isn't that what the wise man says? That a wise woman builds her home, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands? Well, the root of that foolishness is a woman who thinks that she's the most important person in the home. When God is the one who ought to be honored above all. And when we are seeking his will, seeking his glory, seeking his honor, then the things that you've done to me, they're not bigger than the unity that we're supposed to have. There ought to be forgiveness in the home. Amen. Folk ought to just... Doesn't the Bible say that love does what? Cover a multitude of sins. So before you even 
should have to forgive, you ought to not let so much stuff offend you in the first place. And then when there's a time for us to forgive, not allow bitterness to take root, and to do what? To forgive. To forgive. You have too many Christians in too many Christian homes where everybody is going for self. You're going to have problems when you have everybody trying to please self. Because the minute that you don't give me what I want, I no longer, I don't love you. Or you don't love me. Children don't believe that they're loved because mama and daddy didn't give me everything that I wanted. So I don't talk to them anymore. We already talked last week how a child is supposed to honor their parents. They're imperfect parents, yes. Even adult children, you ought to always honor your father and your mother because the Bible says that it's right. You wouldn't be where you are. We want to attribute all of the negative things to mama and daddy and then forget all that I've become. The job that I'm able to hold down. The way that I'm able to take care of certain things independently for myself. I learned that from daddy and yet children want to talk about toxicity about parents. Forgetting all of the good, how they sacrificed for you. And then we think that there's going to be unity. No. We ought to strive, strive to forgive and to see the best. There is a sister. She has gone on to be with the Lord. Sister Creola Lewis. When I was a member, and I've told this story often, when I was a member at the Highland Congregation, I was over there for about nine years before we got the work over here, blessed, was blessed by the work over here. But every Sunday, every Sunday, I, I made it a habit because I, I meant it, just her spirit. Godly spirit would radiate from the inside on the outside. And I would always, in our conversations, tell her how beautiful she was. Even though she was an elderly lady, I always talked about how beautiful she was. Even as she got older and more feeble and, and as things changed, even in her outward appearance, I wasn't talking about that. It was just the godliness that exuded. And she would always say to me, you're looking through the eyes of love. We need to look at each other through the eyes of love in the home. See, when your eyes are eyes of love, then you don't see everything that is done wrong and something to hurt me. The reason why we don't forgive is because we don't love the way we ought to love. Husbands and wives. And I've learned, and I told our kids this, I've been married for 30 years, and there was a time and when I was first married that I would say, and Robin and I would say, that if you did this and did if this one thing happened, then that's the end of that. I've learned that there is nothing. As it's been said, I've come to know that. Where she goes, guess what? I'm going. Where I go, we're going to go. It doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. All the things that we think matter, they don't matter. Conflicts are resolved when in a godly home because everyone is seeking God's way and God's will. I'm going to make these quick, but just please hang on. Read the article and you'll understand why we're going a little longer today. But number five, a godly home produces fruit in the church. A godly home produces fruit in the church. I'm going to go through these very quickly, but understand that it's no secret that God loves for his creation and longs for his creation to do what? To bear fruit. That's what we have been created for, to bring him glory. Bearing fruit brings him glory. John chapter 15, verse 8, that's what Jesus says. That bearing fruit for God brings glory to God. We know from examples in, in, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, where Paul talks about a harvest of righteousness. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, where the Bible talks about this righteous harvest that was produced by the people of Laodicea. God loves for his children to bear fruit. And the result of a fruit-bearing, godly family is, number one, work in the church and service in the church. Thank God for godly homes because those folk in that godly home do what? They're the ones who serve in the church. And they are the ones that God does what? Godly homes are what enable us to have what? Leadership and organization in the church. Isn't that what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3? That a man whose his family has to be intact and godly for him to be a leader, an elder in the church. For deacons, their home have, they have to be qualified and, and have certain characteristics. And so godliness benefits the home 
by allowing those members in the home to serve in the church. It's a godly family that produces godly husbands, amen, godly wives. See, we have to understand that there are things bigger than what you think your life consists of. And we ought to want to have, we have sons, to make them and raise them up in the Lord so that they can marry a godly young lady and produce what? Godly offspring. This is why I, I'm not against education. I don't believe that. I don't teach that the Bible teaches against it. It's just more important stuff for kingdom people. There are kingdom things that transcend and supersede things that have to do with academia. Because it will be us that go and we will be the very ones that complain and say that the church is not sufficient for my needs. Well, did you strive to what? Produce godliness in the home and to produce a family that can serve the church in this way. We have to think about that. And then finally, in godly homes, the members go to heaven together. In godly homes, the members go to heaven. That's what the goal is, isn't it? For us to, to live this fulfilled life, but then ultimately, that none of us are left behind, that we all go to the heavenly home together. We talked about heaven on Wednesday nights for the last several weeks, and heaven is a wonderful and glorious place that we should all want to go. As I've said in times past, heaven is not an alternative to hell. Hell was in the beginning created for the devil and his angels. Heaven is a home for the prepared people of God. And that should be our longing and our desire. And we should want all of our family to be there. That's why godliness is important. And those are the benefits of godliness. Some of us, because we have, 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 had, have had godly homes, we have husbands that have gone on to be with the Lord. And they won't be my husband there but there will be, we will be together forever. Some of us have had children that have died in the Lord and they're waiting for us. That's the benefit of godliness. And so if you're here today and you have not obeyed the gospel, I want to urge you to obey the gospel today through faith, repentance, confession, being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, God promises upon your obedience to the gospel that on that day when he receives his own to himself, that he will give you the crown of life that no man can take away, provided you walk faithfully unto death. And so we implore you today to obey the gospel. Again, through faith, repentance, confession, and being immersed in the glory grace of baptism. And if you are a Christian, or if you have yet to obey and you hear today's message and you say that I've been the source, I've been the cause and I want to be better or I want to be a greater light in my family and in my home and I want to come to the Lord, I'm asking you please don't look at your circumstances and, and, and become discouraged by looking at your circumstances. Reverence begins by seeing how big our God is and his capabilities and his almighty power. So we implore you today to whomever you are to come if you need to come right now while we all together stand and while we sing.